Hi everyone, this is a presentation of the ancient Chinese philosophy of Confucianism. To get started, Confucius lived in the 5th century BCE and was a scholar, philosopher, and political consultant. He didn't have much success or employment in his lifetime, but his ideas took off in subsequent centuries and continue to influence modern-day China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. His philosophy is very practical, focusing on ethics and politics, probably because China during his time was experiencing great political turmoil following the collapse of the Zhou Dynasty in 771 BCE. Perhaps he focused on ethics and politics because he found it difficult to engage in speculative philosophy when society was tearing itself apart. Speculative philosophy refers to metaphysics and uh, religion. It's not that he had nothing to say about these things. He, he, he clearly uh, does think that uh, there is a supernatural realm and that something like God exists. To those of you who are interested in this topic, I would point you to uh, Jeff Ritchie's article in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and I have a citation for that at the end of the slideshow. So Confucius was writing at a time of, of social collapse. We might wonder whether or not China was very individualistic at this time, or whether it was just a fractured nationalism. Things were just falling apart. Houston Smith, who I will quote from uh, several times in this slideshow, uh, in this book, says, China had reached a new point in its social evolution, a point marked by the emergence of a large number of individuals in the full sense of that word. Self-conscious rather than group conscious, these individuals had ceased to think of themselves primarily in the first person plural and were thinking in the first person singular. Reason was replacing social conventions and self-interest outdistancing the expectations of the group. The fact that others were behaving in a given way or that their ancestors had done so from time immemorial could no longer be relied on as a sufficient reason for individuals to follow suit. Proposals for action had now to face people's question, what's in it for me? So there were, Confucius wasn't the only philosopher at the time. There were others who were trying to persuade others to follow them too. And so we've got these uh, two big schools, the realists and the moists. The realists were led by Han Feizu and the Moists by Motsu. Uh, by the way, I'm not an expert at Chinese pronunciation, so don't quote me on any of these Chinese names, but just bear with me. The realists taught laws with teeth. So the solution that they proposed for society's disorder was just to have really heavy laws, be very strict, follow the carrot and stick model, reward people when they do things that are good, and punish them when they do things that are bad. This is a low view of human nature, basically treating uh, human beings like animals, right? On the other side is the Moists, and they believed in universal love. They believed in appealing to people's reason, using argument and persuasion. This is, uh, uh, in contrast, a high view of human nature. They taught objective moral values that we could understand um, if we uh, set our mind to them. But in, just in case that people weren't going to be reasonable, they also taught something about spirits and ghosts to be afraid of them in case, uh, because they could get punished for them. I'm not sure, but I think Houston Smith has in mind here the idea of ancient um, ancestor worship in China. <coughs> Confucius's solution, on the other hand, was to follow tradition. We needed to revive tradition, the ways of the past. Of course, Confucius himself is now very old, but uh, these traditions, these values predated him in ancient China. This was the idea of moral exemplarism. So we need to uh, find people, moral examples or sages that can embody these values and follow them. This was also a very regimented and rule-following lifestyle. The, the relationship between the, the teacher and the student was very, very strict. As Houston Smith describes it, moral ideas were driven into the people by every possible means, including temples, theaters, homes, toys, proverbs, schools, history, and stories, until they became habits in daily life. By such means, even a society constituted of individuals can spin an enveloping tradition, a power of suggestion, and can prompt 
its members to behave socially even when the law is not looking. Uh, if you've read Plato's Republic, this should sound very similar to the type of state that uh, Plato writes about in that book. Okay, let's talk about Confucius's value system. The first value mentioned in Houston Smith's book is Zhen or Ren, and this refers to moral character or virtues. So these are the virtues that uh, char are characteristic of the person who, who lives a good life. I'm going to quote from, the, from Confucius's Analects uh, to help give examples or support each one of these, these values. This one comes from Analects 1.3. Fine words and an insinuating appearance are seldom associated with true virtue. What does he mean here? An insinuating appearance, I take this verse to mean what is on the outside. The, 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 the public face that a person presents is not to be trusted. What, it, what you should look for is what's on the inside, and that is the character. Next, the firm, the enduring, the simple, and the modest are near to virtue. So here are some uh, virtues or character traits. And next, Chung Kung asked about perfect virtue. The master said, it is not to do to others as you would not wish done to yourself. And so here in ancient China, we have an example or a variation of the golden rule. The next value is Junzu, and this is the moral exemplar or the superior person. And so this is the role model I talked about before. In Analex 4, he says the mind of the superior man is conversant with righteousness. The mind of the mean man is conversant with gain. Now, by mean man, he doesn't mean uh, the jerk or the, the foolish one. He means the average person. And so it's interesting that he contrasts the superior man or the ideal with the average and not the worst. But um, I think that's uh, interesting and unique. I'll skip down to Analects 14. He says the progress of the superior man is upwards. The progress of the mean man is downwards. Next value. Li. Li means propriety and ritual. And by propriety, we mean right action or moral action. So these are the, this is the moral obligation that we have to do the right thing. He says in Analex 12, look not at what is contrary to propriety, listen not to what is contrary to propriety, speak not what is contrary to propriety, make no movement which is contrary to propriety. So propriety not doesn't just have to do with action, it also has to do with relationships. And Confucius is known for teaching these five constant relationships. He says these relationships need to be in order if society is going to be in order. So these relationships include the relationship between the parent and child, the husband and wife, the older brother, younger brother, the older friend and younger friend, and the relationship between the state and the citizens. So these are hierarchical, and they need to be ordered correctly. Propri uh, Li also means ritual, and by ritual he means, just as we understand rituals to be, uh, careful traditional rules that are followed. He says ritual, uh, sorry, this is Edward Slingerham, by the way, uh, another great book that I recommend on the topic, Trying Not to Try. Slingerland says rituals are essentially behavioral training encompassing everything from how to conduct important public religious ceremonies to how to dress, enter a room, eat your food, and interact with your parents. And Edward Slingerland says the goal of all of this is Wu Wei or perfect action. The more you practice, the easier it comes. So Wu Wei or perfect action could also mean just going with the flow, the natural way. And Confucius thought that in order to attain this experience, you have to practice and follow uh, the rituals. The next word is de, or I think it's pronounced da, which means moral force or attraction. So this moral force is a characteristic of the Chunzu, the, the, the moral role model. When you see this person, this sage or this moral saint, there's this attraction to them. Right? They, there's something drawing you to them. It appeals to, to you, and so you follow that person. So any government can rule by full force of arms, but the divine mandate rests with the one who rules by moral example. If you have a leader who embodies this day, then you won't need to use force. People will just follow you. <clears throat> 
One who rules by moral force may be compared to the North Star. It occupies its place, and all the stars pay homage to it. Analex 2. The next one and final value here is when. Now, in the list of Confucius, Confucian values, uh, I haven't seen this value except for in this book. So I'm not sure what that means, but it's a really interesting one nonetheless. Houston Smith describes it as the arts of peace. And so what this is is a type of refined culture. And he, he says on page 180, ultimately the victory goes to the state that develops the highest win, the most exalted culture, the state that has the finest art, the noblest philosophy, and the grandest poetry. So one country might have a great military, and that military might conquer many other countries, but even the ones, the countries that it conquers, um, that, that military itself, the invading nation might be conquered if the cultures, if it adopts the cultures of the states that it invades. And that's the example that Houston Smith gives. Let's take a moment to compare the values of ancient China and modern day America. <clears throat> if ancient China is characterized by filial piety, goodness, and ritual, then modern day America might be characterized by life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Notice the focus of these values and how different they are and how different the people of ancient China must have been from the people of modern day America. Uh, Houston Smith has a few things to say about that in the chapter. Um, I point you to that to, to learn more. Okay, now as I said before, there's not a whole, whole lot of speculative philosophy in Confucius, um, but, and he doesn't say a lot about human nature as such, but two later Confucian scholars did. The first one we'll look at is Mencius from the 4th century BCE. He taught, um, he's, he's, he's Confucian, so he's, he, he, he supports Confucius's teachings. He taught however, that human nature is born good, that we come into the world good. And his support for this, his argument is, well, in one case, imagine you see a child falling into a well. If anybody saw a child falling into a well, they would have this sudden urge to help. And that's evidence, he thinks, that we all are born with compassion in our bones. He thinks there are these so-called four seeds or sprouts that we have that only needs to they only need to be cultivated in a Confucian way in order to help us become a, a better person. These seeds include compassion, shame, courtesy, and a sense of right and wrong. Now, on the other hand, just so that we have somebody to disagree with, we have the philosopher Shunzu, uh, who lived around 310 BCE, and he said that human nature is bad. Again, he's also a Confucian. That means he believes Confucius's teachings are right, but as far as his human, theory of human nature, it's different from Mencius. He said that a warped piece of wood must wait until it has been laid against the straightening board, steamed and forced into shape before it can become straight, because by nature it is warped. Or this is the idea that comes from Shunsu. And in contrast to the four seeds, you have the four incipient tendencies. And these are profit, envy, hatred, and desire. This is what we're born with. This is what we're given. And if we just allow them to run rampant, we will end up in a bad state of affairs. We'll be in jail or something. Okay, so finally that gets us to Tian, or this word is translated as heaven or God. So like I said, Confucius doesn't have a lot to say about the supernatural or about speculative metaphysics. He, he says, you are not even able to serve man. How can you serve the spirits? You do not understand uh, even life, how can you understand death? But nevertheless, he does have a few things to say about the other life, about uh, metaphysics. And as I said before, I would point you to Jeff Ritchie's article uh, in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Jeff Ritchie there says that Tian in Confucius's philosophy has these three characteristics. It is aligned with moral goodness. It depends on humans to actualize its will and it is unpredictable when relating to mortals. Okay, there's my reference list. I hope you enjoyed this tour through ancient China.